everybody. Um, I, I want to warn you, we have a depressing one today. Aaron David Miller is my guest. Aaron has devoted his life to Middle East policy, doing so as an advisor to Democratic and Republican administrations on the uh, Arab-Israeli peace process. A couple months ago, Aaron joined me to discuss Netanyahu's scheme to undo the independence of the Israeli judiciary, and this week he was kind enough to return to discuss the Israel-Hamas war. As I say, this is a warning. Aaron and I uh, talked on Thursday, and this drops on Sunday. So there have been uh, a few new developments since uh, we recorded this. Two American hostages were thankfully released on Friday. Thank God for that. But release all the hostages. Also, humanitarian aid is finally getting into southern Gaza uh, through the Rafah Gate in Egypt, but not nearly enough. And we discuss uh, why that has been so hard. Also, there are reports that the Biden administration has urged the Israelis not to preemptively open a second front against uh, Hezbollah in the north. That sounds like good advice, but what do I know? Basically, uh, my interview with Aaron David Miller is a detailed overview of a situation which is, has not changed all that much. And not surprisingly, what Aaron mainly has to say is that things will get worse before they get worser, which is, I'm quoting him. So this is a, a depressing one. And on, on the occasions that we do revisit this subject in the weeks to come, I'm afraid that will probably again be the case. Uh, but it's important. I can say you will get a lot of uh, new information and perspective on a crisis that is likely to uh, go badly and continue to cause lots and lots and lots of people tremendous uh, anguish and heartache. So we got a good but heavy one today, uh, you know, um, for a change. Let's pick up where we left off uh, a few months ago. We were talking about uh, the independence of the judiciary in Israel, which was very controversial that Netanyahu and his his people uh, were trying to take that away. Yeah. And there was a lot of uh, turmoil about that. And when this happened on October 7th, there were some immediate, I don't know how valid this is at, at all, that 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 had taken the attention of the intelligence people and military people, many of whom were against this policy, which really threatens democracy in Israel, that had taken their eye off the ball. Because so many people have asked, how could October 7th have happened? Yeah. Is there any, any validity to that? You know, there's going to be a national commission of inquiry, as there was after the 1973 war. If you haven't seen the movie Golda with Helen Mirren, Part of it is not historically accurate, but her portrayal of gold is extraordinary. But point is, the Agronaut Commission filed an interim report a year after the war, which was until now the greatest strategic intelligence failure that the state of Israel has ever confronted. And Golda Meir was forced to resign. On judicial overhaul, uh, I think the judicial overhaul is dead. If there is a silver lining, and I hate even to use no, that word, yeah, given yeah. the horror, the horrors of what we have witnessed on October 7th, um, it is that there will be no additional effort on the part of this government, whose, this is a national unity government, by the way, it's not right. the, uh, perhaps in name only, because uh, Benny Gantz, who was brought in, former Minister of Defense, Chief of Staff, uh, can't stand Netanyahu, and I'm sure the feeling is mutual. Um, you know, the average length of an Israeli government now since independence is 1.8 years. The Netanyahu government in December will be one year old. I, I don't I, I will not make predictions in, in this podcast with you except one. Next year at this time, if we're talking, uh, Benjamin Netanyahu will not be the prime minister of Israel. As to your question on whether the judicial overhaul and the divisiveness that the Netanyahu government created in Israel um was direct or indirectly responsible for probably the first or second greatest intelligence failure and operational failure, by the way, not just intelligence. 
I think that the, the, the National Commission is going to going to delve into this, but I do believe that it did affect Hamas's sense of timing. I think Hamas has been following, tracking this thing. They've tracked operational readiness in those southern communities along the uh, uh, Gaza-Israel border. I think they were aware of the unrest and the dissatisfaction. So yeah, I think the timing of this uh, on a Jewish holiday on Saturday, reminiscent of uh, October 6, 1973, was part of it. I also believe that um, whether or not it was correct or not, that the judicial overhaul did send and the turmoil of 40, 41 weeks of massive protests, threats by thousands of Israeli reservists not to serve, probably sent a signal uh, of vulnerability. But again, I'm speculating there'll be an extensive national commission to, to deal with that. Just one, one personal note. I was in, in Jerusalem, October 6, 1973. Same sense of vulnerability, of trauma. 2,800 Israelis were killed during that three-week war, which was the largest single tank engagement uh, of two armies, two militaries, including Syria and Egypt and Israel since the end of the Second World War. And yet it was, it was a war on the borders. There was a blackout. The streets were eerily quiet. A lot of stuff disappeared from the supermarkets. But there was never the sense by the end of the first week, of the sense of helplessness and vulnerability that has gripped the country now more than anything else, even more than the intelligence failure, the operational failure, the failure of the Israeli government to be able to protect its citizens in those 20 communities bordering Gaza. That, I think, basically undermines the basic function of a government's legitimacy, which is its capacity to, to protect its citizens. Our mutual friend, Tom Friedman, I think at one point in one of, one of his columns in the wake of 9-11, talked about a failure of imagination. That's exactly what this was. It was a failure on the part of the Israeli intelligence elite and the military, Shin Bet, Mossad, to imagine that Hamas, A, had the capability to do this combined arms warfare attack, air, land, and sea, and failure to imagine that Hamas wanted to do this. The Israelis thought Hamas was consumed with governance. The, the Qataris were bringing in anywhere from 3 to $10 million a month to buck up um, their capacity to rule Gaza. The Israelis were acquiescent in that. Mm-hmm. And Netanyahu, this was a good situation for Netanyahu because it was, it was the so-called three-state solution, right? You had, you had a tiny Palestinian authority, dysfunctional, corrupt, um, Abbas in the 14th, 18th year is four year term. Yeah, Hamasistan governing Gaza, and you had the state of Israel. As long as the Palestinians remain divided, with no monopoly on the forces of violence, no Israeli government, I don't care if it was center left, center right, was ever going to engage in serious peace negotiations. If I were an Israeli, uh, I wouldn't deal. I wouldn't want to deal with a such divided and dysfunctional national movement that didn't control all the guns. That was perfectly okay for Netanyahu, who, as you know, didn't want to become the midwife of a Palestinian state. He's much more interested in midwifing an Israeli-Saudi normalization agreement, and let alone his other ministers. At any rate, I'm sorry to drone out. No, on no. I uh, listen. This is uh, and please, you interrupt me anytime uh, you, you you want. You're the one my audience needs to hear from, not not me. But you you bring up the lack of a two state solution. You know, I grew up in the wake of the Holocaust, and uh, as you know, as I, believing in Zionism and believing that Israel was a sanctuary for people, uh, people who uh, suffered this unbelievable genocide, and of course, uh, Israel needed to be Israel, but. I always also have always felt that there needed to be a two state solution. Yeah. And when I was in the Senate, Netanyahu during some of that time was was the prime minister. And uh, I talked to Secretary Kerry a number of times in, in, in frustration. And is, I'm talking about his frustration and mine. Sure. Ab- about Netanyahu's attitude toward a two state solution, which is his attitude was he doesn't want one. 
That's the only solution, right? Well, let's put it this way. Of all of the proposals, one state, Israel continues to control all the territory. Jordan comes in, somehow giving Gaza back to Egypt. Of all the uh, somewhat coherent and, and other wacky solutions to resolve this conflict, I would argue to you that the two-state solution is the least worst outcome. Let's say it's the best outcome because it's the only separation through negotiations is the only, the only solution that addresses the political, demographic, geographic, psychological challenges that have driven this conflict for decades. I think it was Mark Twain who said that proximity breeds contempt and children. And the fact is that Israel and the Palestinians, if I have any hope at all, it's because of the proximity problem. It's because whether they like it or not, Israeli and Palestinian pasts, presents, and futures are inextricably linked together because of the proximity problem. This is not Israel, Egypt, where you could draw a line basically and, and separate. It's not Israel, Jordan arguably the longest and least defensible border. Now you have two treaties of peace, which are not perfect, but they've been sustained in Jordan since 94 and Egypt since 79. And even if a deal was done with Syria at some point, you would have been able to disengage and detach. The Israeli-Palestinian issue is not that way. That's why there is no precedent in the Middle East for two nationalist entities surviving in a happy state of affairs under one large roof. So as grim as it looks, and it's really grim, this situation now is going to get worse before it gets far worse. Yeah. I, I can't say never. I got two 40-year-old kids. I occupy a tiny space on this planet for a very limited time, uh, mortgaging their future, saying never, it'll never happen, we can't do this, is just morally and ethically, to me, unacceptable. Let's talk about the immediate term, and you, you say it's going to get worse before it gets worse. Yes. And so let's talk about that right now. And I want to ask you some questions. Why has it taken so long to get humanitarian aid in? And by the way, uh, I just want to, th we're doing this on a Thursday. Things will change uh, before this airs on, on Sunday morning. For, and things ha happen that make it worse, including that bombing of the hospital, which uh, immediately was put out that it was Israel that had done that. And from all that I see, it doesn't look like that was Israel. But that has made the Arab street, has roiled the Arab street. So I, my question, I guess, now is what's going to happen next in terms right. of Gaza? Are we going to see an invasion? Is that wise? Is the, Does that just make things worse in a way that will make the, them worse for the near future and the future future? I mean, yeah. is, is there um, – I know the answer immediately after this this horrible, barbarous attack was, yes, you go in there and you – take them out, of course. But is that the wise thing to do? All right. So let's take them one by one. First, Gaza uh, and humanitarian assistance. It, it's simple to describe, very difficult to, to sort of unwind and, and to implement. Right now, the Israelis got half a blockade on Gaza, which means there are only two entrances. There's the Mediterranean, and that's simply not feasible because it can't be monitored. I mean, the Israelis could set up a naval blockade. I, I'm sure they actually have. So if you can't supply by sea, and the Israelis have blocked all of the Gaza-Israeli passages, there's only one passage open right now. It's Rafa. It's Egypt, yeah. Right, it's Rafa. And you have three parties that are determining in the last week why the humanitarian aid that is desperately needed, you've got hundreds of thousands of Palestinians displaced from their homes in southern various areas of southern Gaza. You've got 2.3 million Palestinians in Gaza Strip, roughly twice the size of D.C., 21,000 humans per square mile, among the most densely populated areas in the entire world. So you have three parties down there. 
each of whom have their own interests. Hamas has no interest whatsoever in facilitating humanitarian aid into the Gaza Strip, uh, not unless they can divert it and keep it for themselves, in large part because the more Palestinians suffer, this is the victim narrative. And the victim narrative is part and parcel of Hamas's strategy. I think you saw it in the bombing, the strike on the uh, uh, Al-Ahli uh, Arab Hospital run by the uh, Christian diocese out of Jerusalem. Why? Because the, the more Palestinians suffer, the more Palestinian deaths occur, the greater the radicalization. Aaron, let me interrupt you just for one second on that. Are, are you saying that that was deliberate as opposed to, I mean, no, what, what, I'm, I'm okay. saying that that was a, I mean, again, when the president left Andrews to go to Israel, I think the administration position is they really, they were investigating who did this. By the or, time he landed, yes. he made it clear that it, it was the other, well, what he described as the other team, not a particularly appropriate reference, no. but right, the other team. So somewhere during that 11 hour flight, my guess is that he was briefed by CIA with an independent analysis. Part of that CIA assessment, I'm sure, was based on what the Israelis had found. And that's very important distinction. Right. It was a misfire by Palestine Islamic Jihad mm -hmm. of a rocket launched from northern Gaza into Israel. I think the Israelis, again, it's an Israeli, it's an Israeli source, indicated that Almost 30% of Palestine Islamic Jihad rockets end up in misfires. This one apparently slammed into the hospital. And the propellant from the rocket. Which is not, not, not the explosive. It's, it's, the, it it's what makes created it this go. fireball. Right. right. And that's what, what's happened. And since the Palestinian Ministry of Health in Gaza is the Hamas Ministry of Health, we need to be very wary about numbers, okay? So, uh, no, I'm not saying that Palestine Islamic Jihad attacked the hospital willfully, intentionally. No, it was a misfire. But the narrative of victimization is critically important in Hamas's uh, ideology and its tactics. So back to southern Gaza, they have no stake in, in allowing this assistance to come in. They have adequate supplies of fuel and water should they choose to share them to power the generators that, that uh, power the water, the water pumps to distribute water. Okay, so Hamas doesn't want Palestinians out. Does that mean that Israel must invade? No, we'll get to that in a minute. Okay. Then you, right. got, then you got Egypt which actually controls the other end of the crossing. The Egyptians, for political reasons, for security reasons, have no interest whatsoever in allowing large numbers of Palestinian, uh, displaced Palestinians to become now double or triple refugees. Sure. It's a political issue that is shared wall to wall in Egypt. It's a security problem. You know that Hamas is, was originally an offshoot of the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt. And so, if they open up, if they open up Egypt to them, they the Hamas uh, could, will come in, yes, could come would, in yes. and uh, infiltrate, and that's the motivation you're talking right. about. Worried, on Egypt's worried about infiltration and worried about the the image of uh, on Egyptian sovereign territory, thousands of Palestinians in tent cities, even if the international community is, is prepared to care for them. Now you get to Israel. The Israelis, there's a political issue here. There's huge pressure on this government not to address the humanitarian issue because they're convinced basically that a lot of this humanitarian aid will be used to support Hamas and divert it. Plus, the Israelis are worried about shipments coming into Gaza, which could include weapons. So you have Israel, Egypt, and Hamas, a sort of perfect storm, which has prevented what should have been by now a surge of humanitarian assistance to take care of the basic needs of these Palestinians. And the ground campaign now hasn't even started. I can't imagine what Gaza City, 1.1 million people, where the Israelis judge in northern Gaza is the 
largely the location of Hamas's tunnel structure, its military infrastructure, its leadership, what that's going to look like, what it looks like now. Where are these people going to go in the day, quote unquote, the proverbial day after? Who's going to take care of them? Which raises the question of what the Israelis intend to do. Knowing the international laws of war, which Israel does take seriously, reciprocity is not the issue. The fact that you had a degree of savagery and barbarity in that 24 hour period where Hamas you know, at 6.30 in the morning, having neutralized mm. with drones, both the automatic machine guns along the fence and the sensors, quickly overran the uh, lightly defended military bases and then proceeded to kill, indiscriminately kill, torture, rape, indiscriminately. The horror. I mean, that does not give Israel according to the laws of war, the right to respond in kind. Attacking civilian civilians, the doctrine of distinction, is outlawed. All I'm saying is the Israelis are thinking this through. The president of the United States, I'm sure, you, you heard what he said, 9-11, don't engage in rage and anger, all right? What he was talking about exactly was that uh, we went into Iraq, horrible, horrible right. tragedy, and don't yes. do that. The two longest wars in American history where the standard for victory was never could we win, but when could we leave? So he, he's pushing and pressing the Israelis to think through whether or not there are any alternatives to this. Now, you know, I've heard from Israeli uh, former military and security guys You've got a number of Israeli spokesmen and women talking about what they want to do in Gaza. Most of it is extremely ambitious. We're going to kill Hamas's leadership, probably doable, top leadership over time. But we're going to also create a new reality in Gaza, a new strategic reality. We're going to change the reality. That's the, those are the formulations that the Israelis are using. And that is a different set of challenges entirely. And by the way, it's now we're in the second week of this war, and the Israelis appear to be in no hurry to do whatever they're going to do. Weather is a factor. The president's visit was a factor. Their own indecision about what they want to do, what they can do as opposed to what they want to do. Is there any option of not invading? Well, I mean, I know that in the immediate aftermath, um, there seemed to be no alternative. So the Hamas wants an invasion. Is that correct? Well, there are, there's, it's an argument that, yes, that they're well prepared. You've got a tunnel system uh, that is roughly half the length of the New York subway system, 313 miles of constructed tunnels where the leadership, uh, their intelligence organizations, much of their ammunition, their rocket facilities, all of that, the Israelis are going to have to deal with a situation in extreme, densely populated areas. Um, David Petraeus described this as Mogadishu on steroids, referring to Black Hawk Down, uh, the downing of that American helicopter. Sure. So you got, it's Fallujah on steroids. So all of these combat vets who have been involved in counterinsurgency basically say the same thing. There are precedents for eradicating terrorist organizations. The Sri Lankans did it against the Tamil Tigers. Peruvians did it against Shining Path in the 90s. But it, 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 it took a huge toll on civilian casualties in the first, deaths in the first and in the second. Huge, huge hit on Peruvian democracy. Hamas is not like the Rotary Club. It's not an organization which has a membership list and everybody gets a card and you have social meetings. It's a movement which has ensconced itself in Gaza in the early 80s. It was formed in 1987 with deep roots in the social and economic and religious fabric of Gaza. It's an organizational embodiment of an idea, 
and it represents a considerable part of the Palestinian national movement and reflects a considerable part of Palestinian public opinion. I understand that that half the population of Gaza are children. Under 15, uh, correct. Or, and they're educated, I would assume, by with this ideology. How intractable is this then? Let's assume that the Israelis succeed. And what is that? And, and there's a post-Hamas Gaza. Okay. Okay. Succeeded. They kill all the leadership. They dismantle all of the military infrastructure. So in effect, they have undermined Hamas's sovereignty, its control of Gaza, and therefore its capacity to govern Gaza. And they've done it at a cost which doesn't involve, what, another five or 6,000 Palestinians who have died and thousands more who have injuries that need to be cared for. I mean, then you get you get to the day after problem. So who who takes over? Well, I mean, you know, in a in a galaxy far, far away, I could spin a tale for you right now that that might answer that question. The UN comes in. There's tr- the UN ha- imposed a trust or not imposed um, with UN approval. Created a trusteeship for Kosovo. They created a multinational UN force for security. Why couldn't the same instruments be used in Gaza? You bring in the Palestinian Authority, weak and dysfunctional as it is. You surge, you surge this new, you, you have elections um, for a new Palestinian president and for a parliament and local elections. The Saudis um, surge and the Gulf states surge in hundreds of millions of dollars that the EU gets involved. I mean, I, I could, I could deconstruct that analysis for you right now. And I know. Tell you why it's. It's un- highly unlikely. As you say, it 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 mocks itself almost, which yes. is as uh, depressing as can be. This is not has not been a happy um, interview. It, let, let's talk about the other actors in the region. Uh, th- th- this feels like a Gordian knot of all Gordian knots, um, but. Where are the interests of Iran? Where are the interests of Russia? Right. We have and we haven't even talked about the Northern Front, which is the Israeli which is border. Hezbollah and right, you know. which is a, a, a great concern because in comparison to Hamas, Hezbollah is a very serious organization with a hundred anywhere from one hundred and fifty thousand to two hundred thousand high trajectory weapons that range from 15 to 20 kilometers. They are reported to have scuds that are 700 kilometers. And Israel and Hezbollah fought a war in the summer of 06, 34 days, then 5,000 guys with relatively unsophisticated rockets and missiles shut down the northern half of Israel from Haifa to the Lebanese border the most preeminent military power in the region for 34 days. And now they are exponentially more dangerous. My assessment now is they do not want to risk all of those assets on behalf of the Palestinians or Hamas. As long as Hamas is doing their work for them, why join? You do have escalation on the border. You've seen it every single day for the last week. But uh, Hezbollah is playing by the rules of the game. They're identifying military targets. And so far, the Israelis judge that they're not interested in escalation. You move to their key patron, Iran, which supplies both Hamas and Hezbollah with hundreds of millions of dollars a year combined. And I think the same argument applies. Iran would love to see Hamas do as much damage as they can to Israel. Uh, Iran would love to see the Israeli-Saudi normalization project just just gutted. 
but Iran does not with two carrier strike groups, one of whom the Dwight Eisenhower will arrive, I think, within a week, get into a major military conflict with Israel, which is almost invariably going to mean U.S. involvement. Because the Israelis will strike Iran, they're unconventional and conventional military sites. The Iranians will respond with missile attacks against Israel and probably the Gulf. And, and the Biden administration is going to find itself in a major regional escalation, which is going to result in plunging financial markets and rising oil prices. Uh, Tehran, Hezbollah, and the Biden administration. Hamas may want that, but Israel doesn't want it. Hezbollah doesn't want it, Iran doesn't want it, and the Biden administration definitely doesn't want it. So the uh, diplomats, w- what what are they doing now? What, what is the diplomacy that, that the United States yeah. is doing right now? It's all focused on two issues, deterrence and the humanitarian issue. We'll know if deterrence is working if the conflict with Hezbollah doesn't escalate. On the humanitarian side, uh, it's a problem of space and time now. I don't understand how we are going to, we, the international community, we can alleviate perhaps the short-term needs of the Gazans who are displaced. Who've gotten to the south. Yeah, who move south. We probably, if everything works, works well. But winter is coming. You, You know what that area is like come November. And December, it's raw, it's cold, it's not summertime, which is going to make it even worse. So the president's going to give us an an oval address from the oval, and he's going to make the case that, uh, I mean, what's on the table is $100 billion for Ukraine and Israel. How it's going to be divided up, I haven't a clue. The president's going to make the case that supporting Israel and Ukraine is not just a matter of our values. It's mm-hmm. a matter of our national security. That's that's the, that's the case going to try to make. They're going to throw in additional assistance for Taiwan and probably the border, the border, our border, mm-hmm. um, in an effort to broaden the political support beyond Democrats to Republicans for this. And he'll make the pitch for U.S. leadership. So. Uh, I, I, you know, as central as we think we may be to this, let's face it, we're hostage to events. Unless I'm completely, you know, untethered from reality, the Israelis are going to have to do something in Gaza, and it's going to have to be something qualitatively and quantitatively bigger than what they've done before. And I, I hate to trivialize it by the expression I'm allowed to use, but if you look at Israel and Hamas conflicts over the last uh, 20 years, 2008 slash 9, 2011, 2014, 2021, it's been what I would call a wash, rinse, and repeat cycle. You have these escalations. The Israelis, in two cases, they mounted limited ground incursions. They undermine and retard Hamas's military capacity. They withdraw. The Egyptians broker a ceasefire, and we do it all over again. Now Netanyahu has said we will go out, uh, go up, and we will wipe out their leadership. Right. And I don't understand whether or not that's doable. One one thing is clear in, in the basis of the Black September's uh, attack on Israeli athletes in Munich in seventy two. The Israelis have a list of top Hamas operatives, and no matter how long it takes, in the wake of fourteen hundred dead Israelis many of whom were butchered and tortured. The Israelis are going to start crossing Hamas operatives off that list, not just the ones in Gaza, but the ones who uh, have been based in Turkey, in Beirut, and in Doha. I sense, Al, that that's probably insufficient uh, what's at stake here? And, you know, you know, I, I'm only observing from a distance. I talk to Israelis to just get a sense. What's at stake here is the very legitimacy of the Israeli government's capacity to protect its own citizens. And in view of the intelligence and op- operational failures, the largest single attack 
terror attack in Israel's history. It's among the most deadliest in the modern period in the international world. And it's the, it's the largest number of Jews killed in a single day since the end of the Nazi Holocaust. There is a sense that Israel, the Israeli military has to perform. They have to, they have to succeed in this, Al. That's, it's, I mean, it's incredible what's on the line. I don't know what it means. It could mean they're less ambitious in an effort to, to demonstrate a, a, some, some demonstrable success, or alternatively, that they have to throw the dice on the table and become more ambitious. I just keep coming back to the day after. Right. There's no happy note. There's no optimistic note, it sounds like, to end on, except that the aspiration in the, in the end has to be what we talked about earlier, which is, uh, I, I believe, a two-state solution uh, to democracies. Israel is supposed to be a, a democracy, a democratic Jewish state is what understand the definition to be and in the region you have palestinians and if you're going to be a democracy they're going to have to have their democracy as well and from this horror i don't know how long it will take but that has to be the goal that people are keeping in that israel i hope that their leadership and we are, I know our president is, I know Tony Blinken is, I know our diplomats are, that's our goal in the, in the, in the future. And it's just, it's a long, long ways away though. Yeah. We're in a long dark tunnel and I don't know exactly what will emerge on the other side, Al, but I, I agree with you. Uh, when all is said and done, Israelis and Palestinians will still be there. Neither of them is, is going anywhere. There's no military solution to this problem. You need leadership. I, I think we talked when last time, our conversation, I said to you, we need four things. And we've never had them all together. You need leaders on both sides who are masters of their political houses, not prisoners of their ideologies or their own politics. That's number one. Sadat Begin, King Hussein, Rabin, even Rabin Arafat, Mandela de Klerk. You need ownership. You know the old expression, I think Larry Summers and Tom Friedman are still fighting over who coined it, but I think neither of them did. In the history of the world, nobody ever washed a rental car. You know that, that expression? No. People won't wash rental cars because they care about what they own. And the reality is, there's insufficient ownership on the part of Israelis and Palestinians right now. Number three, you need effective U.S. mediation. And that's going to be, I, I would argue, it's still the United States, despite all of our uh, challenges and flaws and biases. Um, but it means being reassuring, for sure, and providing enough honey. But it also means, at times, being tough and being willing to apply some vinegar. Kissinger, Carter, my former boss, James Baker, really the only three Americans who were able to reach any sorts of agreements, and they weren't all the same, um, within what I call the zone of conflict. The Abraham Accords are remarkable, remarkable achievement, but they belong in a different category. They are not in the conflict zone. And, 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 and disputes, arguments, and conflicts in the conflict zone where people for decades have been dying, where they're traumatized, where there's overlapping sacred space, right? You've got two mosques, a Haram al-Sharif, uh, sitting on top of the Har Habayit, the Har Habaytim, the two Jewish temples of old, the first and second temple underneath, overlapping sacred space. Um, so you're going to, you're going to need effective, I would think U S mediation. And finally, you're going to need, and I think you and I are in agreement. And, you know, a lot of people think the two state solution has gone the way of the dodo, but I'm telling you, give me just another 
instrument or another end state ending that makes sense. I just don't see any of them. Those four factors, leadership, ownership, effective U.S. mediation, and an agreed end state, just give me the first two, Al. If we had the first two, we'd have, we'd have a reasonable chance of getting into a negotiation that could actually solve this. But we don't. Well, thank you. And, um, you know, this will uh, get probably get worse before uh, it, it gets worse, as you said. And um, but we're just praying for uh, some light yes. in, in this in this region. Yeah, we're going to pray. We're going to hope and we're going to also work so that even if it does get worse before it gets much worse, um, maybe, just maybe, there'll be something at the end of this on which pe- pe- ordinary good human humans, Al, who want to see this ended on both sides. Thank you. Thank you so much. Well, I, I hope you enjoyed uh, listening. That beautiful music is by Leo Kotke, the great Leo Kotke. I want to thank Peter Ogburn for producing this podcast. We'll talk again next week. 